Our next speaker is uh, Mr. Tim Spring, who's a partner with uh, Moore Blatch Solicitors. Uh, Moore Blatch have for many years been always sort of in the background. Of, I suppose that's true to say, isn't it? <laughs> um, Janet Ferno always spoke well of them as an organisation who had helped several members negotiate the sometimes tricky path to getting their rights as patients. They usually send a representative to our conference and their level of expertise can be illustrated by the fact that the delegate they sent last year, Anne Cassidy, was both a qualified doctor and a qualified lawyer. Tim has been generous in advice in the past to us as an organisation. He has links, medical links in that he's a council member of the Royal Society of Medicine's patient safety section and he's uh, worked as a defence solicitor for the NHS as well as representing patients. So he sees these issues from a very balanced viewpoint. Uh, and he will take questions afterwards, yes? Yeah, okay. <coughs> Am I switched on? <coughs> thank you, Howard, and thank you, David, and uh, thank you, all the members of the society. Um, the story, I think... Um, for, oh, I've called my talk when things go, go wrong, but I should emphasize for the, for the most part in the a NHS, things tend to go right. But given the nature of my work, I tend to come across those situations where things very sadly have gone wrong. But I want to just explain a little bit of the history to the work I do. I qualified in 1982. And at that time, 80% uh, of the country was financially eligible for legal aid, and it was possible to bring a medical negligence claim uh, <coughs> comparatively uh, easily. During the 1980s, the know-how developed uh, amongst solicitors how to uh, bring, these, uh, bring cases arising out of situations where care has fallen below an acceptable standard. But it's important to appreciate that it's actually... Doctors and clinicians that deter determine the standard and, uh, and provide the opinion upon which cases can be brought. It's not, not lawyers. But the growth of that knowledge and that expertise was funded by um, a legal aid system which now sadly uh, doesn't exist. Following the 1980s, when the number of uh, cases arising out of poor treatment uh, increased, uh, clinical risk management began to be started up at the early 1990s. And clinical risk management is really uh, about prospectively identifying what your risks are in a given situation uh, when providing patient care and learning from the experience of when things go wrong. So with that explanation, I bring myself to the title of my talk, which is When Things Go Wrong. And I would say when things go wrong, that provides inevitably an opportunity uh, to, to learn so that we can improve patient care. So I believe what I and my colleagues do on a daily basis is make some contribution towards uh, an improvement in, patient, improvement in patient care. Now, <coughs> uh, it's up, obviously up to the health service to, to learn from these, uh, this uh, e experience. And through the NHSLA, which investigates uh, clinical mishaps and through the medical defense organizations that represent GPs, that is how it's supposed to work. So what are a patient's uh, options when they think something has gone wrong? Well, the obvious thing is to raise the issue with your, uh, your doctor. But what you should know is that doctors for a long time have been under an, uh, a professional obligation to uh, uh, own up to any errors in treatment or any mistakes that they have made. But a very important development uh, ha occurred two years ago when the duty of candor was introduced, which places an obligation upon uh, institutions, upon, uh, uh, upon uh, P uh, CCGs, and also upon, uh, upon trusts. Right. Now, if, you, if you've raised an issue with your doctor and you're not happy with the response, the Patient Advice and Liaison Service exists to help, to help you. When this was started, it was originally named as a patient's advocacy and liaison service, and it was thought that the term advocacy was a bit too uh, contestatory, so it was changed to patient uh, advice. They can help you formulate uh, concerns and provide you with the, the uh, information that you may need to properly articulate what those concerns are. If you're not happy with the result that you get, then make a formal complaint. Uh, only after that, uh, if you have suffered something that's clearly 
significant should you think in terms of uh, looking uh, to bring a claim for compensation. If you make a complaint, who do you make the complaint to? Well, if it's the GP that's made an error, you can make a complaint to the GP, GP the CCG. Uh, if it's a dentist, obviously a dentist, but if it's a hospital, you can uh, raise a complaint directly with a the hospital. There are time limits. You should do that within a year. There are tips that I would say. First of all, a lot of the letters of complaint that I see tend to be quite long and they include a lot of extraneous information that isn't uh, germane to what the patient's complaint is. So I would say keep your letter succinct, uh, write to the chief executive if it's the, the, uh, the concern is with a hospital, and uh, compose the letter in numbered paragraphs, setting out a short chronology. That way, if you get a response that doesn't fully engage with what you've articulated, it'll be very clear for you to, to see. Now, a lot of hospitals will immediately jump in and before writing a re reply to you, offer you a meeting. I wouldn't accept that in lieu of a written response. I would accept going to a meeting because a meeting provides obviously an, an opportunity for an interactive uh, pr uh, pr process. You can ask for that meeting to be recorded. Um, you can record it yourself. Many trusts proactively uh, adopt that. And if, you, if they do that, then afterwards you can, get a, you can have a transcript and you can go over it and you can see what you're told. Now, <coughs> most concerns in the health service are resolved through the, the PALS route or through making a complaint. It's only in exceptional circumstances that clients come to see me if they're unhappy. But I want to just explain a little bit about the process of bringing a claim. First of all, I think it's very important that you only instruct a specialist solicitor. Where can you find a specialist solicitor? Well, there are 100,000 plus solicitors in the country, but there are only 250 medical negligence specialists on the Law Society panel. You can, go, you can get names from the Law Society. And I've given the uh, details in the last slide of how to contact the Law Society. That solicitor will then obtain the medical records. You will probably know that you are entitled to get a copy of your records by using the Data Protection Act, but the, a solicitor can use the Senior Courts Act to get full pre-action disclosure, not just of medical records, but all the other documentation that may have been brought into existence as a consequence of your complaint or as a consequence of risk management processes that the hospital properly undertakes. So a lawyer can get access to far more material directly than a patient can. The next part of the stage is to get an independent expert opinion. And remember I said at the beginning, it's not lawyers who articulate any criticism, it is the, it is the medical profession itself. We then prepare a letter of claim, and if we don't get a response within four months, <coughs> and usually we don't, we then have to start thinking in terms of court proceedings. That's the next stage. Very few cases end up going to trial. Just to give you an idea, I, I, for 17 years I've led a team of, uh, of, of lawyers. We have only had one case, no, two cases go to trial. Uh, <coughs> and during that period of time, we lost one, we won one. Every, every other case has been successfully brought to a, to a conclusion. So it's very rare that a case gets to court. But you must always prepare cases, a lawyer must always prepare cases as if this is the one case that's going to court, because if you prepare as if you are definitely going to go to court, that's the best guarantee of not going to court. When is care? What do you have to prove? <coughs> well, you've got to prove two, three things, really. That care fell below an acceptable standard, that's a question for the doctors. That it caused or materially contributed to an injury, that again is for a medical professional. And you've got to prove the physical and financial consequences past and future. So that really uh, makes the, the assessment of these cases, the, at the, takes us to the individual level where we've got to look at an individual's circumstances and that depends on the evidence that the patient can provide. When is care substandard? It's substandard when there there's no responsible body of medical opinion that supports it, or it is illogical. I'm mentioning consent, not because consent tends to come up in cases involving hemochromatosis, 
But because this is the one area that clients appear to be uh, particularly fascinated <coughs> uh, about, and there has been a recent uh, development uh, in a case called uh, Montgomery, which uh, again is referred to in the, in, in the last slide, which has shifted the, <coughs> the, um, uh, the, the um, uh, focus from what a doctor thinks a, a patient should be uh, told to what a patient uh, thinks a patient should be told. So if you, this is a, a direct quote from the, uh, from the judgment, and it effectively means that a doctor should tell a patient what he knows or ought to know that a patient would regard as significant. So it isn't a, a doctor's knows best situation. And um, if, uh, and one of the things that it doesn't appear in my uh, biography is the fact that uh, I practiced law in Canada during the 1980s, and there was a case called Rival and Hughes, uh, which is a Canadian case, and really uh, the, the concept that the then Chief Justice enunciated in that case is the one that we have now adopted uh, in our Supreme Court uh, just last, last year. How do you prove an injury resulted? Now, this is the, this is the, the very obvious dif uh, difficult area because we've got to show caused or materially contributed to all those potential things. Particular difficulties with hemochromatosis. They may be non-specific. They might be attributed to alcohol. In fact, that in my experience, very frequently are. Insidious damage can silently accumulate. Joint degeneration may have re <coughs> resulted in any event. That's a very common argument. And many of you will be perhaps familiar with that. Very important to understand the timeline in any medical negligence case. And <coughs> cases involving hemochromatosis are particularly problematic. If we were looking at a surgical error, we would be able to say, well, that's when the mistake took place and that's when the damage occurred. The problem with hemochromatosis is that the damage uh, can be silently accumulating before we get to the point in time at which we can properly say the uh, condition should have been identified and the mistake was made that it wasn't. Uh, this also happens in, for example, cases involving cancer. We might get to a point where we say that uh, the uh, cancer should have been identified, but then we find that the evidence is that by that stage, in any event, the die was cast by virtue of the staging. So here I've got some, we now move into some actual case studies, and I've Dealing with these quite um, briefly, um, because um, I think they just serve the purpose of giving an, an example. And this is a, a, <coughs> a lady who went to see her, her GP, uh, the ferritin. She was feeling uh, uh, generally unwell, uh, malaise, fatigue, things that you will all recognize. Uh, but the important factor here is that um, her brother has actually been diagnosed with the condition, and she was naturally very anxious about what that would mean. She was referred to a haematologist, and these are <coughs> this is what happened next. Um, this was a, a particular example of, I think, of a, quite an uncommon example of uh, a haematologist uh, somewhat um, uh, arrogantly saying that... Um, well, was, well, some of the correspondence in particular was uh, not taking on board, as, 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 as a hematologist properly should, the concerns of the, of the patient. And so she went through a whole series of investigations before transferring to another hospital where they did the genetic test, the treatment started. Now, the first opinion that we obtained, uh, and I come back to the point about what you have to, to prove, said that the haematologist had not fallen below an acceptable standard because there was a responsible body of opinion that would have followed the investigatory, investigatory path that she decided should be followed. And I thought, well, that strikes me as being a bit illogical. So I then went to another expert, and he uh, essentially said, yes, that's quite right. <coughs> it is illogical. So you can see that although a doctor isn't guilty of negligence if he acts in accordance with a responsible body of opinion sometimes that can be thought to be illogical. Here we have a case involving <coughs> a six-year uh, delay, and classically, again, we've got the GP assuming that these results were indicative of a, a difficulty with alcohol consumption.
this next study, <coughs> again, we've got a, a, a lengthy period of, uh, of time. And this was a particularly tragic one because uh, the patient ended up with uh, liver failure and then uh, had to undergo a transplant and in the course of that transplant uh, suffered a non-negligent complication of the of the surgery uh, he but he would not have been in the situation of requiring a liver transplant uh, had uh, his situation been been picked up earlier so the case arose not out of his death as a consequence of the surgery but the fact that he needed the surgery in the first place and expose himself to the risks of uh, surgery. He had to do that. Uh, a risk, uh, a well-recognized risk materialized and he very sadly died. Again, we have a <coughs> uh, uh, another uh, situation involving um, uh, a GP. Um, <coughs> and um, here, uh, what happened was that uh, the GP refers to the cardiology department. We get the abnormal uh, test results, but the results are not uh, passed over as they should be, and the necessary action that should have been taken was not taken. Uh, and that, that too, is something that we commonly see. Now, the next, the next uh, case... Um, is uh, again one uh, involving uh, delay, again six years, but the medical evidence that we got suggested that uh, this simply resulted in a modest uh, acceleration of joint problems <coughs> that were already uh, present. And it's in the area of concerns about the uh, damage to joints that we have a particular problem here because in many of the cases the expert evidence is that and we heard from professor Ritter this morning uh, that it's the duration uh, of the problem that is uh, is key and in many situations the die is cast even before we get to the point in time at which the mistake is made so in cases involving uh, joint uh, damage, we essentially have to prove that the mistake occurred at a point in time, well before uh, the patient becomes uh, symptomatic or there is something that's radiologically uh, evident. And that can make a great deal of difference in the potential value of a claim. So if you have somebody who is economically active, a, a high earner, and it transpires that as a consequence of what's occurred, they have a loss of, loss of earnings, then you can see that that over a, over a normal life expectancy would, end, would, would be quite a large sum. But uh, if uh, the expert evidence is that this would have happened in any event, then it's impossible to actually make a, a, a convincing case as far as that's concerned. Now, how do you fund a claim? <clears throat> the, the principal way in which you fund a claim is by entering into a conditional fee agreement and a no-win-no fee agreement. Legal aid has virtually disappeared. It's only available for obstetric cases involving neurological injury to children. Trade unions sometimes provide funding. Paying privately is uh, not an option I, I would recommend. Some of you uh, may find you actually have insurance, but I would strongly... Uh, uh, say to you uh, that it would be very sensible for you if you do think you've got insurance to first of all choose the solicitor you want to handle your case rather than uh, find yourself in a situation where you're pointed to the solicitor that is actually chosen for you by an insurance and it's very important to, to instruct somebody who is experienced. Compensation. Uh, the the pain, suffering, loss of immunity means uh, a sum that is uh, effectively um, determined by reference to uh, a tariff. Uh, the upper end of the scale for brain, uh, very serious brain injury and tetraplegia would be 250,000. So the numbers that you hear about in the newspapers of people recovering millions are where there is a loss of earnings claim that continues through, an, or through uh, a lifetime 
or the care requirements of the individual as a consequence of the, what's befallen them are significant. So we can claim past financial loss, future financial loss, and uh, interest. And now I come to my last uh, slide, which are some of the useful links. Virtually everything that I've said to you uh, today, you can find uh, and easily research uh, on, the, on the internet. That's all I have, and I hope that's been of interest to you. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. We're almost at lunchtime now. Have you got time for questions? Five minutes. Three Five or four minutes? Questions. Okay. Yeah. Mary and just down here. Hi. I'm Mary. I'm from the Northwest Group. If anybody's the Northwest Group and Northwest area, we're down here if you'd like to say hello. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> This is about people who've had problems. Have you had situations where patients who have tried to be more active in getting their care or their health are taken seriously, either by GPs or consultants, and perhaps the cons consultants have said they regard them as vexatious or sort of half-threatened, that they'll complain and get them moved, or is that something that you can help with, or would that just go through Powell's? Uh, <coughs> I think I'd be inclined to go through Powell's. I mean, I mentioned that case where as an example of a degree of, uh, of arrogance, and the, the correspondence was quite exceptional. I shared it with my colleagues because it's something that you don't often see. I think there is a, there's a generational difference uh, in the attitude of clinicians uh, now uh, to, the, to the ones that I uh, used to be doing battle with 25 uh, uh, years ago. Uh, the modern clinician seems, sees themselves as very much a partner with the, uh, the, the patient and are far more open to... Uh, receiving expressions of concern. And they know from the GMCN guidance and the, the duty of candor, the whole culture has changed as far as that's concerned. To be someone as far away as possible. <laughs> <laughs> from, from your experience, how, how much should the um, cases fall at the door of the GP and how much at the consultants in terms of with a condition such of this if you get to a consultant with a proposed level of specialty are, are you more comfortable and in better hands uh, that's a very good question I would say it's 50 50 um, if I come back to this particular hematologist the quote in the letter that if I recall it correctly was writing to the GP I've tried to knock some sense into this uh, woman, something like that, uh, which is quite extraordinary. <coughs> um, and I mentioned in those case examples where things had gone wrong at the hospital level. So I would say 50-50. And, and, and actually a number of the cases that we've brought have, we've brought them against two, two defendants. So we've, we've said fault lies at the GP level and fault lies at the hospital level. We, but I, as I mentioned before, we only can do that if we've gone to leading experts in the fields and they say the care has fallen below an acceptable standard. Karina, oh, hang on, is, is David? Oh. Just, just, oh. Oh. Wait for the microphone, please. Thank you. Just in relation to, to what you just said there, do you find that the defendants, GPs, consultants, of course they've got to accept the, the decision on a legal level, but mm. do they accept it on a personal level and reflect on that and really see kind of the issues, do you think? Well, of course, as, as a claimant lawyer now, I don't have that access to, to the clinicians that I used to have when I defended the NHS, when I investigated medical mishaps. And uh, I've been back doing claimant work for 17 years, but if I cast my mind back to the 10 years I spent acting for the NHS, I would say the cases actually do affect a number of them quite quite deeply. Um, I've known uh, clinicians that I uh, defended decide to take a different course, uh, a different pathway with their medical careers as a, as a consequence of uh, the stress uh, that it's, you know, the, the, uh, and the, the, they've reflected upon what they've done and they have felt quite bad about it. And I suspect that must happen. But sometimes, you know, when you're looking at it from the claimant's point of view, and I'm looking at the correspondence, and if I'm dealing with an aggressive lawyer on the other side, I'm kind of thinking, well, what is that GP thinking? Is, it, is he giving those instructions? But I know that on the other side is a defendant lawyer doing what a defendant lawyer generally does. Maya? 
Um, my name is Moira. I'm part of the Northwest Support Group for Hemochromatosis. And we find that when we're talking to our people in our group, the people that come to us for help and support, that they found the biggest problem is through getting the initial diagnosis at GP level. And it's it, what, one of our drives in the Northwest is to try to raise awareness at that, that basic level. Where the, once people have been um, suspected of having hemochromatosis and are referred on, then from then onwards, they don't seem to have many problems. It's that first interface. And that what we find is the thing that we're trying to do in the Northwest is try and encourage our people to go to the GPs and raise awareness there. Also pharmacies as well, because we think that is another area where people who've got problems will go to for some sort of advice. So that's something where we think the NHS should be putting more effort into, getting the, that diagnosis level at that stage. Well, early diagnosis is key to avoiding harm in so many ways. Uh, before I came down here, I was watching on TV this morning uh, a lady talking about her experience of, um, uh, she'd been recently diagnosed with bowel ca uh, cancer. Classic example of where telltales sort of uh, symptoms and things were not, you know, picked up. This, this happens in, in so many areas, but it's early intervention that makes the difference. Absolutely. One more. Hello, my name is Gary, and I have a question on the insurance you commented on. Mm. Do you, as the um, person who's insured, get to choose your solicitor? Or does the insurance company get to choose who you use as solicitor? Well, that's a good question. In theory, <coughs> you have complete uh, sort of uh, choice. Uh, and I would say that you should, try, should exercise that choice. Because if you are insured, it's quite likely that you will be referred to a non-specialist. You might be referred to a personal injury lawyer. You might be referred to, well, if, 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 if you're lucky, you might be a medical negligence lawyer, but perhaps one that's never dealt with this type of, uh, of case. So I would, what I would do is I would say to you, choose your lawyer first, and then that lawyer will take up the, take up the issue on your behalf with the insurer. That would be the thing to do. Uh, another point about insurance is this, that most policies require you to report an event within six months or, uh, uh, of it happening. And of course, we're looking at a, co a condition where you may not know at the point in time at which a mistake was made. All those clients that, that I've uh, referred to, they didn't know. Uh, and the time, uh, the time, that time period is not measured from the date of knowledge. It's actually from the date of the event itself in the case of most policies. So that's what makes insurance a little bit limited. Conditional fee agreement is very simple and straightforward. It's a document you could, well, again, I've referred to in my last slide where you can actually read, the, read that document on, uh, online so you can see what it says. That's brilliant, Tim. Thank you very much. Very concise and very interesting. <laughs>